Welcome, welcome, welcome in everyone. Welcome to Care Concierge with Care Patrol, where education is the heart of everything that we do. We appreciate you being here today. It's a busy Friday. And I know that you all have many things probably in front of you in this afternoon. So we appreciate you taking a break with us. It is a little overcast today. So it's appropriate that our topic is it's raining dementia and we are Care Patrol. And this is Care Concierge with Care Patrol where education is the heart of everything that we do everything that we do for our clients, everything that we do for our referral partners, and everything that we do for the providers who we work with to support aging adults in the state of Alabama. We enjoy the opportunity to provide education to you um, six times a month on Monday, or excuse me, Mondays and Fridays. And uh, we are accredited by the Alabama Board of Nursing Practitioners and also by the Alabama Board of Social Work Examiners to create and provide and credential these contact hours for you. And we're blessed to have that ability as well. We appreciate you joining us, those who've just come in. It's Care Concierge with Care Patrol, where education is the heart of everything that we do. Um, we are going to, on this overcast but warm day for December, uh, going to address the topic of it's raining dementia and our own C.W. Merritt, uh, who is a nurse of 30 some years uh, practitioner uh, and uh, is also uh, someone who uh, has worked in many settings and has gratefully at this point in his life and career dedicated himself to helping Care Patrol serve patients and clients better. And he will bring with him today his expertise uh, in terms of nursing uh, uh, information. Uh, so it'll be a little different spin than what you get with me, who, as you know, is a non-clinician. Uh, we are, uh, anyone who wishes today to receive a certificate must uh, complete our evaluation. And our evaluation is um, at https colon forward slash forward slash www.surveymonkey.com forward slash lowercase r forward slash seven all uppercase letters y M as in Mary, six, C as in cat, eight, C as in cat. Now, as you see on the screen, this evaluation is password protected. We'll give the password out about 1250. And we do this because it allows us to show to the board of social work examiners that those of you who are social workers are participating in a live or face-to-face -face contact hour, hence the password protection. You may have missed when I read just now, and I'm posting again uh, into the uh, chat room, uh, the uh, address for the evaluation. I know some of you are on, uh, on phone uh, and others are unable to see a screen for whatever reason. So I read as well as post into the chat room, our evaluation link, and I'll read it one more time. That link is HTTPS colon forward slash, forward slash, www.surveymonkey.com, forward slash, lowercase r, forward slash, seven, all uppercase letters, Y, M as in Mary, six, C as in cat, eight, C as in cat. And I hope you'll remember as we go through the day, the training that you have the ability to unmute yourselves uh, and um, you can participate as you like in the uh, uh, in the uh, 
uh, discussion. We'd love to have you join the discussion. I think that we're enriched by your opinion and ability, and we appreciate you joining in. But if you're not comfortable unmuting or, or aren't able to do so, you're certainly able uh, and, and welcome uh, and encouraged to use the chat room. We'd love to have participation and love to answer any specific questions, clinical questions that you may have. So without further ado, I will uh, cede the floor to our own C.W. Merritt, and uh, he will assume his presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. Am I coming through okay, Sean? You sound great and you look great, C.W. You clean up well. Thank you, Sean. I appreciate that. Uh, well, let's hope that that compensates a bit for my technological dysfunction here. This is not my forte, the technology. So Sean's going to help me run the slideshow today. Thank you, Sean. You're most welcome. Thank you all for joining us today. Today, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, dementia and especially to focus on the, the, the title today is It's Raining Dementias. I chose that because it has come to my attention over the years that there are so many different forms of dementia and so many different approaches to it that it's really confusing just to understand that there are so many and how and what each one is about. For the purposes of this presentation, I'm not going too deep into diagnostic studies or pathophysiology. We will touch on it. Um, I'm going to keep those uh, for the next course that you request if you are interested in that subject matter. So we're going to keep it kind of, I guess, not on the too heavy side in terms of uh, the science. And instead, we're going to talk about dementia as sort of a catch-all phrase, an umbrella phrase, if you will. I'm sure many of you have heard a doctor or seen it documented that the patient's got dementia. End of story. So, you know, this doesn't give us much to work with in terms of understanding the trajectory of the disease, pathophysiology, what treatments may be needed, or even how to teach our patients as we go along. Uh, we're going to look at kind of contrast uh, dementia diagnoses that should be up under the umbrella of dementia and those impostors which can look like a dementia but are not truly a dementia and can con and thusly can either cause misdiagnoses or complicate our understanding of the disease process that for the patients we're working on. Um, there are some complexities involved in ruling out those non-dementia diagnoses and conditions that can appear on the surface to be a dementia and mimic dementia, um, which can lead to misdiagnoses and inappropriate treatment. Uh, misdiagnosis happens more frequently than we may believe on dementia, and um, it's cost the system a lot of money, not to mention some problems with patient management, as you might imagine. By the, our objectives for today, by the time we finish, I hope we have a little better understanding of the various uh, ways that the term dementia is used. Uh, be able to state a couple of things that um, sometimes masquerade and are misdiagnosed as the dementia, and be able to state three factors that differentiate the most common dementia types that we encounter in clinical practice. So, you know, chime in if you will. What do you think when you hear the word dementia? What is dementia? Uh, share in the chat if you are interested in doing so. I'd love to hear your comments on just that one little question. And I'm sure all of you have some thought of dementia. If you hear that, that a friend, neighbor, family member has dementia, what are your thoughts? What do you first think? Uh, and if you're new to us, we'd love you to join in the discussion. And of course, we won't hold here. But if you have something to offer, please jump in anytime. Memory issues, Ms. Smith says. Tara Upchurch says forgetfulness, loss of memory. Those are indeed symptoms of dementia, Alzheimer's, Lewy body. The thing we have to be cautious about that, and I thank you, thank you for bringing those details forward. Uh, the thing we have to be cautious about is clinicians, particularly in acute care and home care, where we're dealing with the initial onset, sometimes the complications related to a dementia or, and or just those symptoms uh, or teaching families how to take care of patients home or at home or what to expect over time. 
So those are indeed exactly the kind of symptoms we hope to look at and differentiate a little bit from um, what is truly a dementia. And Thomas, so if you'll, Thomas Casola, excuse me, says thinking and memory issues impacting functioning, which I think you will very much touch on later today. Denise McNichol says problem solving issues, impaired judgment. Thomas Casola says impaired judgment, loss of social awareness and personal awareness. I believe you guys have had experience with this. It certainly sounds like it because those are all spot on. Um, so if you'll and and related to what you're saying and the symptoms we're going to that you're discussing, if you'll see on this slide, you see where there's an umbrella that has several different types of dementia listed under it. What it doesn't reflect is that they are probably reigning additionally under the umbrella as imposters, things like delirium, confusion, um, medication reactions, and that kind of thing that we're going to go deeper into later. Next slide, please, Sean. So in order to really understand dementia, we first really need to know how to define it. And I put the, this slide in the next one in to just kind of show that we're not all on the same wavelength. The doctors and researchers are not all on the same wavelength, even about how they would view dementia or define dementia. The World Health Organization defines dementia as an umbrella term for the several diseases affecting memory, other cognitive abilities, and behavior that interfere significantly with the person's ability to maintain their activities of daily living, as noted by our comments. Um, age is the strongest risk factor for dementia, but it's, dementia is not considered to be a normal part of aging. Um, I'm particularly fond of this definition uh, by the Emergency Medical Clinics of North America. Dementia, chronic brain failure, also known as dementia or major neurocognitive disorder, is a syndrome of progressive functional decline characterized by both cognitive and neuropsychiatric symptoms. It can be, it can be conceptualized like other organ failure syndromes, and its impact on quality of life can be mitigated with proper treatment. That is my favorite right there. Um, okay, Sean, next slide, please. Oops. Wait, oh, I'm missing a diagnostic page. Hey, Sean, let's skip on to, I think this is slide four. There we go. As you see here, I won't go in, I won't read it all, but the National Institute of Health have their Institutes of Health have their little spin on it. Uh, loss of cognitive functioning, thinking, remembering, and reasoning uh, that interferes with ADLs. Uh, there, another definition, another comment about the definition is dementia, not a specific disease, but rather a general term for the impaired ability to remember, make decisions, and perform ADLs. Uh, a growing trend among some doctors, which this is something I'm really pleased to see coming into the conversation about dementia, growing trend among some doctors, as we saw with the uh, North American um, Medical Clinics, Emergency Medical Clinics of North America, pardon the confusion, uh, that the trend is moving towards discussing dementia as a brain failure, and most specifically, a chronic brain failure. If I think this is going to be useful moving forward as we are able then to pattern our diagnostics, our teaching, our uh, treatments around the concept of, a, of an organ failure as opposed to the more sort of generalized and a bit mystical term dementia. Okay, we went. I'm all right, Sean. I'm going on to why discuss dementia. Uh, I think this is slide five. Oh, you got it. You're on. Uh, I'm kind of doing a split screen here, Sean, and, and participating with you guys because I'm a little technologically challenged. I had trouble getting all my notes in on the PowerPoint presentation. Well, you're in good company, as you know, with technological challenge, not only with me, but I know some of our listeners in the past, maybe no one today, but. Some in the past have, have uh, forgiven me for my failures because they make them themselves. Well, good. I feel a little less alone. 
uh, <laughs> list. I'm sure for those who are more technologically advanced, it's a little frustrating to watch me fumble along. Uh, so why are we going to discuss dementia? You know, why is this an important conversation? Well, one example is that in October of 2005, the NIH reported that over the preceding five years, the healthcare cost for dementia was greater than for any other disease in the United States. During that same five years, healthcare spending for dementia patients averaged greater than a quarter million dollars per person. That's pretty significant to me. That's not chump change. Uh, and I'm sure we all pay not, along, not only with the human suffering, but through things like taxes and CMS. Um, it's easy to get confused about dementia. I um, myself have been confused about, okay, is this a dementia? What are we really talking about here? And sometimes even the very term dementia can be a little frustrating to me because it's not sufficiently descriptive to plot a course of action. Um, so, and, but on the other hand, it's, it's kind of a tough nut to crack. There's complexities involved in diagnosing dementia and particularly differentiating dementias from other conditions that don't always exist or are a little more clear with some other diagnoses. Even skilled, for that reason, even skilled clinicians have to be careful how they navigate uh, the diagnosis and differentiation. Um, Differentiation of dementia can be challenge, as challenging as the clinical clinical manifestations, pardon me, may be similar and widely varied simultaneously. Uh, the diagnostic testing for dementia types are a work in progress, which the science is still in development. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Other conditions, this is important to keep in mind when we're diagnosing, ruling in or out differentiating dementias. Other conditions can mimic symptoms of dementia and must be ruled out before we can move forward re with rendering further diagnoses. There are so many subtypes. This is, a, this is one of the reasons I want to talk about this, and it will be the focus of our conversation, mainly how many different types of dementia are and how confusing that can be when contrasted to other disease processes and conditions that we might bump into in a clinical setting. Um, some sources, and I, you know, one I can quote that I heard or saw a, a video on, I hope you are all familiar with Teepa Snow, T-E-E-P-A, Snow is in it's snowing outside. If you are not familiar with her, please get that way if you deal with patients with dementia. She's got several YouTube uh, videos that are very useful in understanding how to manage and work with dementia patients and families. Uh, but she and she also is extremely well uh, researched in this area. And she quoted that there are as many as a hundred subtypes of dementia, types and subtypes of dementia. That's a pretty staggering figure. We don't say there's a hundred forms of COPD. Um, there's generally considered to be two. So it, that one thing in itself is a little complex and confusing. Uh, so. The devils we know, so to speak, the dementia types that we all have bumped into in our clinical setting or or at least have heard about or read about include Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal, mixed dementia, which that one deserves an increasing amount of attention, Huntington's disease, a little more rare, but it's under the umbrella. All of these are true dementias. Um, Huntington's disease, Dementia pugilistica, also known as punch drunk or boxer's um, dementia, creutzfeldt jakob disease, HIV-associated dementia, corticobasal degeneration, and senile degeneration of the brain. Uh, this last one doesn't all, always get mentioned or classified as a dementia, depending on who you talk to, but in my clinical experience and some of my research, I find that it is quite applicable to many of our patients, just perhaps under discussed and undervalued. Um, some of the more or less frequently seen and rare dementias um, that come up under the dementia umbrella appropriately are catacele, cerebral, autosomal dominant arteriopathy with subcortical infarcts and leukoencephalopathy. So in order to get your credit for today, you must say that 10 times very fast. Um, so I'm not going to 
belabor the details of that. Uh, it's let's just say it's rare and complicated. Uh, another one that we could possibly bump into, although it's rare, is progressive supranuclear palsy. That too belongs under the dementia umbrella. Uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus is something I have seen in clinic in the clinical world be both quite threatening and with a high level of symptomatology. And it is noted that it can progress quickly, although it is a form of dementia or causation of dementia that can be sometimes more successfully treated. A atypical Alzheimer's is out there too, to make it a little more confusing. The frontal variant of Alzheimer's disease, uh, also known as FVAD and the posterior cortical atrophy that is uh, also a form of Alzheimer's. So uh, these particular uh, diagnoses belong under the dementia umbrella and they're diagnosed by different mechanisms, so to speak. You know, there are certain lab tests that exist for some of them. Some of these are diagnosed based almost primarily on uh, comorbidities in history, um, as well as some imaging and some blood tests, cerebro cerebrospinal fluid studies. We can talk about that in a minute. Um, vascular dementia itself has four subtypes. Uh, so there's another little something to keep up with. Um, I'm not gonna run through all, all of them, um, but we see a lot, particularly in clinical practice, a lot of stroke-related dementia and multi-infarct dementia. Um, I threw mixed dementia in there again. I want us to continue to keep that in mind because that really is becoming increasingly common, perhaps just by way of greater understanding, if not so much by the incidence of occurrence. Uh, frontal, frontotemporal dementia also has two subsites, two subtypes, pardon me. So just with those two diagnoses alone, we've got six subtypes. Um, fronto, uh, I'm sorry. Some types of dementia are secondary to or caused by other primary disorders. A good example of this is dementia due to a secondary dementia due to Parkinson's disease. There are others. All right, let's look at the pretenders. Next slide, Sean. So I call these the pretenders because they really can look like, at least for a while, all, uh, a dementia. Alzheimer's being the most common, um, they can mimic or they can worsen uh, and sometimes be confusing when we're trying to render diagnoses and plans of care. Uh, something as simple as a UTI or pneumonia in the elderly, particularly in the presence of mild cognitive impairment, um, can really look like outright dementia or in the case of a mild dementia can really worsen the dementia hopefully temporarily once that is, once those diagnoses are treated with antibiotics. Um, there are other conditions that may mimic dementia symptoms um, and they must be ruled out. The, the first step to any effective dementia diagnosis is to rule out other causations such as UTIs, pneumonia, uh, over-the-counter medications, uh, prescribed medications, um, head injuries. I even saw, I even found some literature about ADD and ADHD in the adult or bipolar in the elderly adult. You know, as an elderly adult, particularly an adult who has not been around family or tends to live alone, sometimes ADD or um, depression or some other things can really, bipolar disorder can really look on the surface like a form of dementia. That is so interesting. I had no idea. Yes, depression, particularly in the elderly, can can uh, sort of masquerade as dementia. Unfortunately, the complicating factor for that is early dementia, mild cognitive impairment. Depression is not at all uncommon as a result of being aware of the diagnoses and the stressors that go with it. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so I gave this little puppy here a special slide and I entitled this slide honorable, honorable mention because 
in our clinical practice, it is not uncommon for us to bump into what is commonly referred to as alcoholic dementia, uh, also known as Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. Mm, there's some variations of how it's described, but that's sort of the bigger words altogether it wants to look at. It's uh, Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome is not a true dementia um, by definition, but it's understandable that people would miscategorize it because it looks and smells like a dementia. Uh, it is more categorized by um, low thiamine levels and um, brain atrophy that affects thought and reason. Next slide, please. Hmm. Can't read my own slide here. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is no doubt and by far the most common form of dementia. Uh, the estimates vary. I've read in my studies anywhere from 60 to 80 percent. I actually heard one physician uh, in a presentation say that she thought it was closer to 90 percent. Um, so no wonder we tend to generalize dementias and families also will say mom's got Alzheimer's. It may or may not be accurate, but it is often uh, what we focus on. Vascular dementia ranks only second to Alzheimer's. Um, one thing that differentiates vascular dementia than many of the others is that vascular dementia is not necessarily caused by abnormal protein accumulations in the brain, as most of the others are. Not all, but most. Um, Lewy body dementia is the third most common form of dementia. We see a lot of that, and it's characterized by Lewy bodies found in the brain, which are... Uh, I think they are described as, uh, how do you say this, blobs, so to speak, of proteins that have uh, uh, accumulated together. Early onset dementia is something that kind of scares me because uh, who doesn't forget where their keys are or what they were saying occasionally or the punchline to the joke, that's a bad one. Um, so, but early Onset dementia is now getting an increased amount of attention as it's occurring more frequently in our country. And some physicians are, and really some of the literature already has in place the use of the word of the words. Uh, how is it read here? Early age dementia to be in order to be more clear about um, the type of dementia and the onset as opposed to early dementia, which could occur in an elderly person. It's just the beginning of the dementia process or progression. So that's that's being clarified due to that. Um, mixed dementia, I think, deserves a little more attention. It's on the grow. And I think, like I say, it's, it's crept into the top 10 or so. And I think it may go up because the, over time, as we have more research and more data to look back on, um, because how many of our patients have purely just dementia? I do run into it. I run into the patient occasionally who is otherwise healthy, doesn't take any medicines, or maybe just takes a blood pressure pill or um, something to, of that, to that effect. But the majority of the time, most of our patients, especially as our patients age, um, are become increasingly birthday blessed, I might say. Um, we we see more and more of a mixed dementia, most commonly a uh, combination of Alzheimer's and uh, vascular dementia. Vascular dementia is the number one that kind of pops into the mixed dementia mix. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so I included this just because I wanted to hear what you guys have to say about it. I'm a little opinionated about this one. Pardon me. And I, I admit to that, I'm kind of biased about these two diagnoses and not in a positive way, I must admit. So you guys chime in a little bit and tell me what you think about dementia without behavioral disturbance and dementia with behavioral disturbance. I'll give you guys a minute to respond before I go to the next slide. And when you're asking that, what what are you really asking? How how we would define dementia without behavioral disturbance versus dementia with? Thank you for the question, Sean. That's a good one. Uh, I guess I'm sort of I'm 
thinking there are people on this call who have experience with the use of these two terms in clinical practice. Okay. And, you know, for me, I have struggled to understand how we apply that. Uh, how do we apply those two diagnoses? What do they mean? How do we develop a plan of care around them? In fact, I'm going to go ahead and go to the next slide, Sean, while folks put in their comments. Um, and so here's my questions about it to other clinicians that have bumped into this. So how do we determine a level of care based on those two diagnoses? Uh, the expectations of clinical trajectory? Uh, Thomas Casola has said that he thinks it is helpful for the distinction uh, of this practice, help others, family, and caretakers to address needs. I think there is some accuracy to that. That is one positive uh, aspect of using this, those two diagnoses. I guess in my a lot of my clinical experience with those two diagnoses have been in the hospice arena. Uh -huh. In the hospice arena, the, the, starting around 2016, those two diagnoses cannot be accepted as an admitting diagnosis because they're not sufficiently descriptive of what the trajectory of the disease may be and thusly what the uh, goals of treatment would be. Any other comments? Not Thank you for that. But I have a question. As you know, I'm ignorant. So, uh, what constitutes or defines a behavioral disturbance? Anybody in the group want to pipe in? Oh, we got a quiet lot today, CW. It's Friday. Ooh, I guess folks dude, are ready to it's, go. Time, it's time for a Friday afternoon nap, I'd say. Yeah, it's, it's probably getting close. Yes. Yeah, so typically, so be a dementia without behavioral disturbance is just that. What we typically see, you know, forgetfulness, memory problems, reasoning problems, as as the disease progresses, unfortunate things like swallowing issues, you know, decreased level of consciousness, et cetera. Um, Lisa McNichol has a comment. She feels that when someone is threatening at home or verbally abusive to their caregiver, she considers that behavioral disturbance. Absolutely. And that is spot on. And thank you very much for beating me to the punch. That is another useful uh, or, or meaningful um, set of problems related to uh, dementia with behavioral disturbance. Also, another thing is it has implications. For example, if we go to a skilled nursing in facility environment, um, that might trigger what is called a level, which involves some assessment of, you know, mental health issues and behaviors that may or may not preclude a person being admitted to a skilled nursing facility, or if admitted, what kind of alterations in the plan of care will be appropriate. So it has its use. Uh, those two have their use. They also have their limitations. Next slide, please. Mm, well, we've talked about that. I uh, went on too much about that. Next slide. Okay, diagnosing dementia. Um, blood test, identification of characteristic clinical syndromes for those who don't. For me, I had to think about how to apply that. And basically, a clinical syndrome is a constellation of symptoms that are consistent with any particular disease <clears throat> or diagnosis. Um, some researchers and doctors and doctors have indicated that uh, dementia can only be diagnosed by autopsy. I bumped into this in a practical sense, particularly with hospice, where I needed a diagnosis to get a patient admitted to hospice by family desire and by the appropriateness of clinical presentation. Uh, and I, particularly, I've had psychiatrists more than one tell me and a family member that they can only differentiate their loved one's dementia by way of autopsy. So clearly, that has some pretty impractical implications in a clinical setting. Uh, so I, I quoted here that the Mayo Clinic, um, their research indicate, indicates that 90% of the time, uh, Dementias can be diagnosed and differentiated prior to death. So let's see. Well, I'm going to get into that later on. That last comment, we're going to go to the next one. 
Are you on dementia causation? That's where I am. Yes, I've got a slide out of a couple slides out of sequence. Oh, okay. um, when I tried to add in later, I couldn't couldn't figure out how to get them in the <laughs> where I wanted to be and how I wanted them to look. Uh, so they don't actually show on your presentation. I see. Well, just just uh, I'll, I'll stop interrupting. No, you're doing fine. Thank you for keeping me on track. You know, adult ADD is a problem. I'm living proof. Um, so the causations of dementia. So most researchers believe that the majority of dementia types are caused uh, primarily by abnormal cum accumulations of various proteins in the brain. One clear example of that, it would be the an Alzheimer's patient, the presence and or biomarkers indicating the presence of amyloids. Um, and what happens in that case, amyloid proteins will have a bit of sometimes, they tend to be a pretty stable protein, but in patients with Alzheimer's, there's sort of a folding is, is it to, as it's described of the amyloid proteins, which then results in sort of the more fibrous part of that. There are some, apparently some, how can I say this? They can become sort of a fibrous accumulation of proteins in the brain. Uh, the other most cause, common causative factor of dementia is thought to be due to vascular insufficiency of various types in the brain. So this is something where we see microvascular disease is common. Um, that's probably the most common one, microvascular disease, as well as things related to TIAs and stroke and chronic insufficiency, atherosclerosis, anything that is vascular in nature that would prevent an on would not provide or block a continuous flow of oxygen and other nutrients to the brain. Mm, okay. Genetics play a role in the development of Alzheimer's in particularly with the mutation of three genes, three genes, the most clearly of which having been identified and having uh, clinical implications sooner than later is the uh, apolipoprotein E4, uh, also abnormal amyloid protein deposits in the brain of Alzheimer's patients are causative. Um, well, we talked about that. Another one that's gotten a lot of attention lately, another cause of dementia, particular uh, pugilistic, dementia pugilistica, boxers uh, um, dementia, is due to um, repetitive head injuries. We're seeing a lot of conversations about that in sports like football right now. Of course, you know, one of the things that is involved with the repetitive trauma becomes some scarring and as in Alzheimer's, an increased uh, amount of amyloid deposits. Let's see. Filamentous inclusions of the tau protein appear to be strong, a strong causative factor in the front in frontotemporal dementia. We'll take just a second and back up. I think we've done the slide, but I did it out of order. My, my apologies. I got you. Thank you, Sean. Somebody's got to keep me on track. I'm going to take it aside for a minute and just talk a little bit, put a spotlight on Alzheimer's for just a second. I don't think this shows in your slide presentation, but I wanted to kind of, before we launched off into discussion, further discussion, I want to use Alzheimer's, highlight it a little bit and point out some details, maybe have a conversation about it as it is the most commonly uh, found form of dementia in our country and indeed across the world. So dementia, I mean, Alzheimer's disease is defined as a progressive neurodegenerative disease affecting memory and thinking and making the person increasingly dependent on others. That seems to me spot on in terms of clinical application. Um, it is thought that the accumula accumulation of amyloid plaques is responsible for dementia associated with Alzheimer's disease. However, there is increasing evidence that low levels of protein in protein with the nomenclature of NPTX2 not depositing, but um, abnormally low levels of it in the brain that may be affecting the ability to uh, reason and how the connections in the brain are working. 
it's it's essential in the neurons to strengthen circuits in the brain without which the uh, brain cannot process information. So if there's a low level of that combined with the deposits of amyloid, well, there you have it. Um, okay, said that. I know y'all can't see this. I'm stuck. I have a question. Uh, okay. So I'm just, you know, I'm just struggling with it. So the the punch drunk, and I forget the correct term. Jalistica uh, dementia. Yes. So, person suffering from is this someone suffering from CTE? Who then? I mean, is CTE in it of itself a dementia? I don't know if in a scientific sense, if I have a, a clear answer for that, I believe that it is. And I believe it's closely related to or very similar to dementia pugilistica. That's why I threw it in there. That's a really good question. Let me confirm what I believe about that and get back with the group about that. We can send out an email, however you want to go about that, Sean. But that's a really great question. Yeah, we can answer any questions. And, and as we're sort of nearing the end of the slides, if people have experiences with dementia patients or with family members or loved ones who've had dementia, and there's anything you'd like to point out, clarify, or uh, enlighten us about, we'd love to have you join in as CW uh, continues uh, discussing Alzheimer's and other dementias. So just once again, folks on Alzheimer's for a minute, um, when it comes to diagnosing Alzheimer's, a variety of methodologies are, are necessary. Uh, so the doctor should take a complete thorough history from the patient and the family, including a history of medications, diet, past medical history, and any changes in behavior, personality, or ability to carry out daily activities. Other tools the doctor may employ to diagnose dementia include but are not limited to cognitive testing a psychiatric evaluation blood and urine tests brain scans such as computed tomography mag uh, mri or positron emission tomography pet to support an alzheimer's diagnosis or rule out other pos possible causes it's interesting to note that particularly the pet scan has some applications in actually identifying the presence of amyloid plaques. Hmm. And, and um, we talked a little bit, CW, about the fast scale for dementia. Is that something you're able to speak to? Absolutely. I love the fast scale. Those of you who are not familiar with the fast scale, uh, please familiarize yourself with it. Uh, unfortunately, my dementia is acting up. It's a func uh, functional assessment and staging tool for Alzheimer's, I think is what the acronym stands for. It essentially defines seven stages of dementia progression um, with each set, each of the seven having subsets, variables of presentation, mostly focused on function, ambulation, activities of daily living, executive functions such as paying bills, this kind of thing, all the way down so you get to the seven, the, the final sort of 7E e kind of area where 7D, 7E, where we're approaching death, there's no speech, inability to hold the, hold, for a person or hold their head up. They probably have breathing problems, I mean, uh, swallowing problems, which may lead to aspiration. Um, they are probably significantly malnourished by them because they're unable to take sufficient PO intake uh, due to the neuromuscular function decline. So it's a really great snapshot of how to view your patient. There's also, and to teach your families about what to expect next. It's also one of the primary tools you use to qualify or disqualify a patient for hospice, just as a side note. Because it, it also includes life expectancy, which is what I found so interesting that life expectancy varies by type of dementia and, and it can vary widely by years. It can vary quite widely. Uh, Alzheimer's in particular can have a long, slow progression with some sawtooth patterns, better and worse. If we look at something like a frontotemporal uh, dementia, the progression tends to be unpredictable, a little different in its 
in how it looks uh, in terms of things like extreme emotional responses, et cetera, and can progress quite rapidly. Uh, you know, normal, I mean, um, oh goodness, non-pressure, non -pressure, I can't remember where, hydrocephalus, uh, if it's not treated, it, it is, progresses quite rapidly. And the notes that I read from doctors say that they expect an untreated case to, to have about a year of life expectancy after identification. Now, is that um, an autoimmune response or no? Is it at all related? It's the, the causation of normal pressure hydrocephalus. Thank you. My dementia acted up for a minute. Um, is frequently idiopathic. In other words, the doctors don't really know. However, there are some okay. cases, and I'm sure clinicians have seen this. This is the ones I've seen the most of, uh, where some type of brain injury, uh, be it trauma, a history of encephalitis in the past due to metabolic disorders, et cetera, that can trigger normal pressure hydrocephalus. And would one live a, could one live a significantly long time with that? Or is it a pretty much a, a 12 month life sentence? I think it depends on early diagnosis. There are some interventions that can be done uh, I didn't prepare a list of that, so I'm not going to launch off into it. But I, I did find some research and some where some doctors had put out articles about how that particular diagnosis can be detected and can be treated and thusly extend the, the life of the patient. Okay. Um, so uh, going back to Alzheimer's, you know, the doctors, now we have a couple of blood tests that we can, can be indicative of Alzheimer's. Uh, sort of to measure levels of beta amyloid, which is one of the proteins that accumulate, accumulate abnormally in Alzheimer's patients. Um, the most definitive way is generally believed to, in terms of a lab test, to have an indication of whether a patient does or does not have Alzheimer's is biomarker test of cerebrospinal fluid, which does get done in a clinical setting uh, with some degree of frequency. However, it's off, that particular test is often deferred due to issues related to pain, cost, and risk. Okay, kind of been over. I'm looking at dementia causation. The next slide, I believe. Sean? Yes. Well, now this oh, is wait a minute. We're at the conclusion. Yes. Um, okay. But well, you can, I uh, think you can, you can, what is it called? Uh, uh, improvise if you like. Well, I, one thing I somehow in the translation of the slides, I, I really didn't get in here enough. i use the word enough is the importance of being aware of the pretenders when we're diagnosing dementia. Um, and also to be aware of, Ex that how many dementia types they are and how complex the diagnosis and differentiation can be. Hence, some even highly skilled clinicians otherwise kind of shy away from going from going down the pathway of differentiation. Um, and, and one important point to remember, a takeaway from this, I hope everybody remembers, is a patient with a delirium may not necessarily be uh, have dementia. The same could be said for depression, adult ADHD, a head trauma, um, medic reactions to medication, including prescribed medications over time. I've seen some instances in clinical practice where a patient has been receiving a particular medication over time. And after some time, even though the medication may work well to begin with, we can begin to see things like some confusion, some alterations in how a patient approaches ADL, alterations in reasoning, um, maybe even hallucinations, which can be part of uh, particularly Alzheimer's and some of the other forms of dementia. So, so it's very important when we're looking at a patient who we suspect may have dementia to rule out absolutely UTIs, pneumonia, medication reactions, some of those things we've already discussed. That's a point I want to leave out in the air, as well as to kind of give everybody a little reassurance. 
you're not the only one that may be a little confused if you get way off deep into a rabbit hole about dementia or even in clinical practice sometime. So that is sort of my conclusion. Um, it's dementia is a growing problem around the world. It's thought to, it's expected to increase uh, 30 fold, I believe is the statistic I read from the uh, WHO, which is pretty, pretty significant. Um, and I hope this helps in some ways to provide a little more clinical knowledge and understanding of how to get to better patient outcomes through early identification, early rule out and differentiation of, of dementia types. Any questions? It seems to me that rule out is sort of the, the takeaway here is ruling out every other possible instance uh, before you can even address whether it's dementia. It is indeed the first and more, most important step in diagnosing dementia, no doubt about it. And it's time for the password, y'all. I've, I've read the address once or a couple of times, and I'm, I'm going to read it again in case you missed it. Uh, it's HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www.surveymonkey.com forward slash lowercase r forward slash seven all uppercase letters, Y, M as in Mary, six, C as in cat, eight, C as in cat. And our password today in honor of our chief clinical officer, C.W. Merritt giving this presentation is Care Patrol. And that is spelled with a capital C and a capital P and no space between the words, Care Patrol, one word, capital C, capital P. And Denise McNichol has a question uh, for us or for you, CW. She says, when dealing with a person with dementia that is perseverating, perseverating on, excuse me, Denise for messing that up, on specific topics and is becoming more and more demanding, how do you diffuse the patient? Any tricks? Well, the first thing I would suggest is when your shift ends with working with that patient, have a nice glass of red wine and take some deep breaths because that can be so frustrating to work with. I know from personal experience, um, you know, you want to be calm, patient. Of course, redirection is a common approach, but it, it often doesn't, in that particular case, it doesn't work for long when it does uh there's a you know when we're in school i'm sure all of us i know most of the folks who went through nursing school back when they were dinosaurs like i did you know we were taught to always reorient our patient um every time and the, the takeaway i've got from that about dementia dementia has changed that so they said you're not going to try to tell you know miss jones at 3 a.m when she's sundowning that it's really Saturday when she says it's Monday and Roosevelt is no longer the president, you're going to listen. You may even agree in this particular case, although it would not be correct in other clinical and with other diagnoses to do that. So I think distraction is probably the primary way. Sometimes there are some medications that will reduce that sort of obsessive kind of behavior or help with it a little bit. Uh, finding an activity that they particularly enjoy. One of my favorites is the baby station uh, that I see a lot in the assisted living environment, uh, which is a great environment for these patients, particularly as they progress to the locked dementia units, also known as the SCAL specialty care assisted living. That's those staff, the staff there usually have experience and additional training in dealing thing, dealing with issues like sort of an obsessive or recurrent behavior that or verbalization that will not stop. There is no, in my clinical opinion, I'll dig around and see if I find anything else about that particular question. But to me, there's no silver bullet about that. It's a combination of redirection, finding activities that keep their attention, um, and maybe medications and a lot of patients. And maybe rephrasing what you're asking in a way 
it may be that the person can't really envision or, or you know, cognate what it is that you're offering or asking or presenting. So you may have to rephrase it in such a way that, that they can. And this may also require some patience on your part because you may need to wait 20 or 30 seconds while they process what you just asked. And another thing that I've sort of learned, um, which I've learned just in generally in life, is if you want somebody to do something, the best way, it's a sort of a psychological verbal trick, is to say, let's, let us go and, let's do this. And if you say let's, it, it's more of a, hey, I'm with you all, we're, we're, we're comrades, we're doing this together. It's not a, you need to do this, you ought to do that, you need to do that. It's more of a, hey, we're in this together and let's, let's you know, let's take a bath because we, we need it. That's a really good point, Sean. Thank you very much. Um, Wendy May has had a good point too as well. She said, come back every 10 minutes and try again. And I know that that can work. And then Thomas Casola is asking, any suggestions to address when a client slash patient is in denial about memory loss? That is a toughie. The conundrum there is that along with that memory loss, there is often some, you know, there is usually a negative impact on reasoning going on. Uh, so in my experience with that, you know, including with my mother-in-law, who passed away due to dementia it was not fruitful or productive and it was and i would analogize it to working with a patient who is delusional when a patient is delusional you the last thing you want to do is try to argue or present a counter logic it just further deepens the delusion by way of in their mind validating their delusion their delusional position and i think the number one thing would be to despite the the natural and appropriate um, impulse to try to reason with that person about it, I think listening to them, asking them questions about their feelings, particularly um, asking them if, what in that environment, giving them a couple of options of something else to do or to focus on, not many, just one or two. You know, while we talk about this, you want to walk down the hall, let's walk down the hall. Something very simple, something one step, one um, single increment of request, command, or option at a time. Um, I don't know that there is a solution to that one in my experience. And one of the really frustrating things about a patient in that situation is patients who are able to or are still coming in and out of sort of what I call the dementia zone where they're more or less confused and sometimes seem to be cognitively intact, you know, the, the quote, good days. Um, a lot of times the, the fixation on, I don't have a memory problem. I don't have Alzheimer's is often accompanied by a significant degree of anxiety, depression, uh, maybe even some sort of more aggressive behaviors in that case because at that point in those clear moments it's so scary it's frightening my mother-in-law kind of summed this up when she she was coming in out of lucidity and she said that at one point she's sitting there in tears she, we were having intermittent times where we're discussing the fact she's claiming she does not have dementia and then in a more clear moment she is in tears because what she said several times is, I'd rather have cancer. I don't want to die by losing my mind. It's a very frightening thought. Yes. I don't know that I have a solution, but a lot of empathy, a lot of listening. And then once again, getting back to distraction and redirection are probably good ideas. Right. I, I do have one more thing I want to throw in here, Sean, really quick that I realized mm -hmm. I didn't cover. Um, there is a diagnosis out there called mild cognitive impairment this diagnosis is sometimes called pre-dementia i'm sure you guys have seen it on charts somewhere it can be a frustrating middle ground and it's sort of the middle ground between a little confusion a little forgetfulness that would be not uncommon with age uh and the presence of alzheimer's particularly 
Well, thank yeah. you, CW. It's been a lot of information, and uh, we appreciate all the time you spent on this and all this work that you've done in your past life. And certainly, I thank you for the work that you do for Care Patrol. Uh, I think we've had a, another great day. Join us on Monday. We'll have Latanya, not Latanya Washington. We'll have someone, Nicole, Dr. Nicole. Oh, gosh, Nicole, so sorry I've forgotten. Uh, I, I have dementia. And uh, I'm moving soon. Uh, but thank you all for being with us. Thank you, CW. Uh, if you will, try and get your uh, sir, uh, your uh, 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 evaluation done by 8 o'clock tonight. I can get them out tonight. Otherwise, I'll get it done in the morning. Thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you Monday, I hope. Thank you. Goodbye.